to me, every book that I found, it was like getting at least one or two or three private lessons with that particular person. It wasn't in person with that teacher, but it was their idea about how did they learn how to play the bass? What do they think is important enough to put in a book? And so I, I devoured a lot of that stuff. Today's guest is such an interesting person in the world of double bass, jazz bass, just such a great guy, such an interesting artist. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting today with John Goldsby, who I had on the podcast about a year ago. We got into his whole career from growing up in Kentucky to his work in New York City and now in the WDR big band where he's been since 1994. And so definitely check that conversation out if you haven't heard it. But we're talking today about John's new course with Discover Double Bass. Super cool. It's called Jazz Bass Volume 1. So you know there's going to be another volume. Jazz Bass Volume 1 Building Up. And I'm just such a fan of what Discover Double Bass and Jeff Chalmers, who's the founder of that company, what they're doing. Uh, I've been a fan since the beginning, but they have been putting just mad production levels into these courses. So we've got a trio that John's playing with. We've got all sorts of materials, really in-depth and informative. And we'll let John talk about the details here. Great conversation, and I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, and A440 Strings. More on them later in the episode, and you're going to be hearing two tracks from John as we open and close this episode, Things That Go Bump and In The Hills, and in the course, these complete tracks are available, and also they're available without bass, so you can play along with them, and of course the sheet music, just a couple of the many things in this course. So let's hear about it from John Goldsby. Hey Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Excellent. how are you doing? Excellent, very good. Nice. Thanks for being big down for chatting. I any anytime you got something new on the horizon, I always I, I I had such a great time chatting with you before. So I'd love to talk about the course. I I'm just I'm loving what Jeff's been Jeff Chalmers has been doing with Discover Double Bass. He he and I have become good friends over the years, and I was so pumped. I remember him saying he was hoping to make a course work with you, and then I was just so thrilled to hear that it was happening, and I was following along on Instagram and seeing the course happening and I've gone through it uh, and and I love it and I love the the production quality of it and with your trio and so, so congratulations on that it's a super cool new offering oh thanks a lot I appreciate it yeah Jeff is amazing and I'm really glad he's uh, starting to stretch out and he's, he's got a, now a nice roster of bass teachers and uh, sort of something for everybody which I think is great because uh, you know, I've checked out lessons by Lauren Pierce and David Allen Moore and, you know, everybody's got the thing they can do really well or, or they've got their area of, of expertise. And it's it's great just to see everybody explaining their approach to music. It raises the bar everywhere. Well, and I, I love how you were incorporating the trio into that, too, you know, because like like you're you're demonstrating yourself on the bass or talking through things and then you have the trio. And I just I love what that adds to it. And and the multiple camera angles. I mean, it is it's it's kind of the future of education, this this sort of format, I, I think. And it, it's just really just hats off to you and Jeff. And I mean, just the whole thing. But it's it's a it's a beautiful new course. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, my concept with the course was to, um, you know, when I teach privately, I can really hone in on exactly where the student is. So when people ask me, you know, is an online course just as good as a uh, course in person with a teacher, uh, it sort of depends on the student, depends on the teacher. But uh, when I'm teaching one-on-one, -on -one, I can uh, really hone in on, on the level of the student and also their personality and their approach to playing the bass or practicing and then say, okay, you know what? You can't play an E flat major scale. So let's, <laughs> let's on that. And, uh, you know, then we can work on a, a cello suite in E flat and then we can work on a Samandal etude in E flat. And then we can work on a jazz tune in E flat and, you know, just kind of approach that with the online course. I tried to put, it's a little something for everybody. Uh, so there's some very simple lessons in there, but then it goes to 
uh, more complex etudes, and then it goes to uh, lessons where I just say, well, well, this is an original composition of mine. Uh, this is how I think about the composition, and I do this or that when I'm performing. And here we go, we're going to play it with the trio. And so then it kind of hopefully bridges the gap and takes it into the world of music. Um, I, I think when students are looking at this course, they'll have to decide for themselves, do they start at the the very simple beginning lessons or do they move to the middle lessons and just do the, the etudes with the written out bass solos and things like that? Or do they jump right to the more musical parts where I'm just playing with the trio? So I try to combine it. It's something for everybody, I think, but it's it's a little hard to pinpoint the exact level of the the user with an online course like this. Yeah, and it's great to be able to jump around like like you're describing. That that's sort of the cool thing about that format. You don't necessarily have to go through it at like you would read a novel, you know, beginning to end. If you wanna if you wanna uh, pick and choose a certain section, and it's really easy to navigate through everything. And I love have and, and you know I've loved this about Jeff's other courses, but I love having the written out music there. You get the PDF, you can follow along, you can put the PDF on the iPad and watch you playing through it on the computer or however you want to do it but it's a really it's a great way to to offer up this content and you know i've talked with people about like do online courses replace in-person teaching and i just i don't i i i I agree with kind of what you're describing it's just a different experience but it's it's a beautiful thing too to like package something you have to offer in as clear a way as possible so like that people would still obviously benefit from taking a lesson with you in person or or however they'd take it but it's just really cool to hear your thoughts and to see you playing and to see just the the detail you can get and you can watch it over and over and fast forward and rewind and it's so there there are definitely some beautiful things about this kind of format great yeah i think so too uh, the good thing about the video course is you can, like you say, watch it over and over. So it's four hours of video. And if you yeah, are, are checking out whatever the, the lesson on major scale fingerings, then you can spend, you know, every day, an hour for a week, just looking at that over and over or practicing those etudes over and over and then move on when you're ready. So it's not like uh, it's a one shot deal where, uh, yeah, you come to my house and then we spend an hour together and then that's it. When I was coming up and learning how to play the bass, I really didn't have, uh, well, I had a a very good classical bass teacher. His name's Daniel Spurlock. And in the seventies, he was the principal bassist with the Louisville orchestra. Uh, but there were no jazz bass players in Louisville who I could take lessons from. Um, so I took lessons with a guitar player named Jeff Sherman. And then I, I really bought a lot of any book I could find on jazz bass playing. So I got uh, Rufus Reed's book, uh, Ray Brown's book. Uh, Back then, Chuck Scher had just put out his jazz, his first jazz bass book. And Ron Carter had a very thin book on, uh, on jazz bass playing with some blues lines in there and stuff. And I found kind of a rare book of Oscar Pettiford, uh, uh yeah tunes that he had written and some basically uh scales and exercises uh so to me every book that i found it was like getting at least one or two or three private lessons with that particular person it wasn't in person with that teacher but it was their idea about how did they learn how to play the bass what do they think is important enough to put in a book and so I, I devoured a lot of that stuff. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Apply graphite, like pencil lead, to the bridge and nut, the contact points of the string, to ensure the strings slide smoothly on their way up to tension. This prevents them from getting stuck and unwinding or pulling the bridge so that it leans. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. With Upton Bass, there is a lot of dialogue back and forth between Upton and the person they're designing the bass for. Here's Gary and Eric on that topic. By the time I'm taking an order, we may have a dozen emails. We got a couple phone calls back and forth. I mean, 
it, it is extremely rare that the phone rings, hey, first time caller, uh, here's my credit card. Yeah, yeah. We've got a relationship. Oh, yeah. Hours and hours you know? and hours. Right. So Gary right. and I have, like, we've listened to you enough that we've, within your budget, We've gotten you into the right base the first time. Listening is what it's all about, and that's what Gary and Eric and everybody at Upton excel in so spectacularly. Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thanks so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass, and I've always been impressed by how Steve manages to get basses sounding so vibrant, whether it's a student-level bass or a top-of-the-line professional bass. Here's Steve on some of what he has learned in terms of setup. When steel strings came into general use around 1959, the German bass makers flipped out, and they really got scared that they're going to get big shiploads of bases back that got wrecked by these high tension steel strings and so they did three things that really changed the function of the instrument. They shortened the string length and they lowered the neck angle so the bridges weren't that tall anymore and then they made the tops a lot thicker. They really wanted to ensure that these bases were not going to come back across the ocean uh, for work anymore and so the bases tend to sound kind of nasal and they didn't have any depth. They didn't have a chest voice at all. Yeah. You know, and so what we do with increasing the neck angle, and we can also increase the overstands for modern playing, can get up into thumb position a lot easier. So a neck reset can accomplish that. Sometimes we'll transplant a neck or make a new neck for these bases that might have a string length that are not friendly to modern playing. Learn more about what Steve can do to get your bass playing better and check out his great selection of basses at steveswanstringbass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. I, you know, I've been following your, I remember us talking about this a year ago, but I've been following, I've been a fan of yours for years and your writing. And, you know, I moved out here to San Francisco and I got rid of all almost all of my physical books because I was just I, I, making the move, but I brought your book. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and, that, and that, the, is, is the jazz, is the, the jazz bass player book or the jazz bass book, what's the exact title again of that? The jazz bass book. Okay, yeah, and I love it because it's a, it's a compilation of so much of what you wrote for, well, for bass player. Uh, bass player opinions, magazine. Right, yeah. So, so that's... I, I wrote the jazz bass book really before Google was a thing. Uh, 1999 or so, 2000, I was starting to work on this book. And uh, I, I was very impressed by Mark Levine's uh, The Jazz Piano Book. I thought, I think that's a great book, still is a great book. And uh, at that time, I th thought, well, yeah, wouldn't, it would be a good idea to call my book The Jazz Bass Book. And like I said before Google, but it was probably the best move I ever made because everybody who goes on Google and Google's uh, the search words, jazz bass book, I'm looking for a jazz bass book. My book pops up. So <laughs> I lucked out. Uh, but yeah, I, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate the kind words about the book. I think it's still a valuable addition to the the library of books out there for bass players. Well, I remember that book uh, popping up. It, I, I bought it in a physical bookstore, you know, because sort of going back, uh, you know, 16, 17 years, whatever that was. But I think it was Performers Music in Chicago. And I remember wandering through there. I'd go look for bass sheet music. Um, and I remember seeing that and, and, and picking it up. And yeah, I've, I've been, so it's so cool to see you. Uh, and I know you've done uh, online uh, th uh, projects, you know, similar to this in the past, but it's so cool to see you joined the Discover Double Bass uh, crew of tutors, as Jeff calls them, and and four hours of content. You filmed four hours of content for this course? Right. Four hours for this course. Eventually, I think there's a course number two coming. Um, but yeah, four hours for the, the first course. And uh, like like I said, I, I tried to, to give people the basic exercises and then the exercises as applied to through etudes and then also some real life examples of me just playing music with a trio. And Jeff put together this great trio uh, for me. Uh, yeah, I, I had never played with him before, but really uh, uh, a couple of fantastic musicians. And uh, yeah, I, I thought the everything worked out really well. Jeff is very organized and kind of has his uh, pr production system down now. 
<laughs> yeah, it has been fun to see him evolve the system through the years because I remember checking out the very first courses like, you know, one camera or what, you know, a couple shots at most. And, and just to see how, how many p- different cameras were going for that session. There must have been a, a, a bunch of people running different gear. Right. Well, um, there were two two camera people and then Jeff also uh, – <laughs> would grab a camera every once in a while. So I think they had two stationary cameras and then two uh, manned cameras. And then sometimes Jeff would be on, on still another camera. So it was often four or five cameras on different parts of the, of me and the base. It's it's uh it's so cool to have a bass player behind the scenes like Jeff. You know, it's like um it, it you know, it could could it be done, you know, with not a bass player sure, but just to have that expertise. I just think I think that lends a special, you know, eye to like what to focus on and everything. I've noticed that through his especially all these recent courses like with Adam Ben Ezra or your course or Dave Moore's course or some of these. It's just really it's 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 just the shot I want to see usually as I'm going through the course. Yeah, he's done a great job. And, and I think the teachers are, it's such a broad offering of uh, expertise. That's the thing that impresses me. It's not just, you know, a bunch of jazz players or a bunch of classical players. It's uh, also, you know, um, something for everybody, really. Yeah, it's very it's very cool, and I can sort of see the, the the intent behind like like bringing new people in, and it's just so useful. I was um, I was playing one of Adam Ben Ezra's pieces, or trying to play this piece, "Can't Stop Running," and I was I was kind of learning it, and then Jeff came out with that course with Adam, and I just said yes, and I watched his bass drumming, you know, just some of his techniques over and over, and I I got it. I've been playing that piece. Uh, I just played it last week in Spain, and. Uh, I've been, and it's thanks to that course. So I know, I know folks are going to have a similar experience uh, going through uh, these four hours uh, and, and pulling different things, uh, what you've done. Right. Oh, that's great. Yeah. A, a lot of my students are into Adam Ben Ezra that he, he's, he's hot at the moment. <laughs> so uh, for good reason. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I, I'm glad I've, I've gotten good feedback about my course. I, I think uh, the best thing that somebody can do in, when they produce a course or, or write a book is to explain how did I learn how to do the things that I do? Because, you know, I, I can do certain things very well and I, I can't do everything on the base, but the things I can do well, it's because I've practiced certain techniques very slowly and then spent time uh, with the bass and also with the repertoire and learning the music, how, how does the music sound, how is it supposed to sound, and kind of separating technique from from the music and then applying the technique to the music and then hopefully at the end just forgetting about the technique and trying to make music. Every violin shop has its own unique origin story, and here's A440's Michael Spadero on how the shop got started. My mother-in-law started this business in 1982, and she was a professional cellist. But uh, the story she told me was that Camille, my sister-in-law, is a uh, violinist with the L.A. Phil. Mm-hmm. And when she was maybe in high school, her violin was being repaired in a shop. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, the shop owner had some legal problem where, like, the Cook County Sheriff or someone confiscated all the stuff. Okay. So the only reason, the only way for my mother-in-law to get her daughter's violin back was to buy all the contents of the shop at a police auction. Okay. So (laughs) since she had all these instruments, I think that's what initially made her start a shop. It's a great shop. I've gone there for years. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Michael. And folks, check them out at a440violinshop.com. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. 
Did you know that they regularly ship bases nationally from coast to coast? Contact their team to find out more information about the shipping process and how you can get your dream base delivered to your doorstep. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at baseviolinshop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. You, you also did a, uh, like about an hour long, I think, interview with Jeff uh, that I was watching through a bit uh, that's on YouTube. I'll make sure to link up to that. But it's really cool to hear you and Jeff just talk about kind of the journey. I, I know we've talked about that, but I, I love the path that you've been on and with WDR, Big Band and the work you've done, you know, for the last few decades and then every th- your work in New York. And it's just it's uh, that people should definitely check that out, too. Just it's, it's great to hear your uh, your your story and your path in your own words. Right. Yeah, it was, uh, Jeff surprised me because I I had forgotten that he had been a student at a workshop that I gave in London maybe 25 years ago or some, you know, way back when. Uh, But he pointed out that, yeah, he he bugged me for a lesson. I finally gave him a a private (laughs) lesson, you know, and it's kind of on the side of the the whole workshop thing. so yeah, these these things are important, and uh, that's that also points out one of the things that I tell students: uh, the people you meet along the way, uh, you never know that they, they might show up again ten years, twenty years, thirty or forty years later into your career. You know, the pe- maybe the people you go to college with, you know, could be that forty years later you still are making music with these people, or at least have a a business relationship with them. So um, it it pays to be nice to everybody, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that is for sure. And that's so funny. Like who would have thunk that 25 years ago, the student bugging you, you'd you'd be then filming something, but that's, that's so the the world we live in. It's such a small world. Uh, You never know who's going to play a part in your life uh, years down the road. And, and I love it. You're also, um, Kind of switching topics back to what we were talking about earlier. You're you're already writing. The first issue of Bass Magazine came out, and you've got some material in it, don't you? Right. Uh, I I talked to uh, Chris Jeezy, who was the editor of Bass Player Magazine, who now is uh, one of the edit- editors uh, at Bass Magazine, which is an online publication. And he suggested, well, Larry Grenadier's got a new album coming out. You want to talk to Larry? And I've, um, this is another situation. Uh, I've known Larry for years, not really well, but our paths have crossed for years. I first met him when he was 14, and I was teaching at an Abersold workshop. I think I was 22, uh, and it was in uh, San Jose, California. And uh, so I had Jamie Abersold had hired me for this workshop. I was kind of a one of the the newbies teaching for Jamie, and Todd Coolman was the other bass teacher. And we flew out to San Jose, and uh, I remember this this must have been the the early '80s. But Larry came in as a student. He was 14, and I still remember he played uh, "No Greater Love" in thumb position which scared me to death. I was 22 and I was sort of getting my bass playing together, but I never expected a 14 year old to even, you know, (laughs) come close to playing in thumb position, much less, you know, play a a nice swinging version of uh, uh, No Greater Love. Uh, So yeah, that that was my introduction to Larry Grenadier way back then. And through the years, we've kind of kept in touch or we run into each other every once in a while. And yeah, he's just one of the greatest bass players on the scene, in my opinion, you know, just a fantastic uh, musician and kind of transcends the bass. So for uh, BassMagazine.com, in their first issue, which came out in March, uh, I did a nice interview or longer interview with Larry Grenadier about his new album called The Gleaners, which is a solo bass record he did. Fantastic album, really wonderful it's almost all solo bass except for a couple of tracks where he does uh yeah overdubs with two or three or four basses 
it's it it's such a great what what a what a phenomenal musician and like you said transcends the bass i'm such a such a fan of larry's and you know at the isb the 2017 uh convention larry played a bunch uh he was one of the headliners and he played several of the pieces that would end up on that album and mm-hmm. yeah from here in the bay area I, I larry and i had a fabulous chat for the podcast maybe two years ago or something like that. But I, I admire the heck out of him and, and, and whether it's with Brad Meldow or this solo project or anything, I, I can't say enough good things about him. So I will be sure to link up to that new base uh, magazine uh, interview and uh, folks should definitely check that out as well as Jeff's uh, new course that, that you did with him and uh, everything else that, that you're up to. I, I, I love having you on the show, John. Yeah, it's fantastic talking to you and I, I appreciate the time and, uh, yeah, let's let's keep in touch. One, two, one, two, three. John, thank you so much for chatting. Can't wait to do it again soon. And folks, check out John on his website, john.goldsby.de and this new course at discoverdoublebase.com. Links to both of those are in the show notes. And I'm having a great time connecting with these folks as these new courses are coming out on Discover Double Bass. Jeff is just in full throttle putting out courses here. So we've heard from, of course, Lauren Pierce and Jeff himself and Adam Ben Ezra, all of whom are on the site, as well as Danny Zeman and now John Goldsby. We're going to connect again with David Allen Moore about his courses, which are very cool. Olivier Babaz coming up soon. And yeah, it's a great excuse to sit down and talk about a specific Topic, which I love doing. I love having people back on the show multiple times. And speaking of having people on the show, if you've got a suggestion for the show, reach out to me at feedback at contrabasedconversations.com. I'd love to know any guest ideas you might have, or uh, just let me know a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what bass you're playing on, or if you're not a bassist, and we have a lot of non bassists in the audience, so I'd love to hear from you too. That would be great. Contrabase Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And if you're looking for a bass or a bass loop, Luthery or String Luthery in the Dallas area. Mitch is just east of Dallas. Check him out online at mitchmooring.com. And thank you so much to Krista Copper for going through and cataloging and organizing all of these topics we talk about on the podcast. And get ready to hear Krista talk about her new project, which is a podcast. Very cool. That's coming in the next couple of weeks. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 